those verses that I don't know. So it's kind of kind of peculiar. Um, we we're gonna talk about that, but there's a lot of things that we could talk about. Truthfully, I've been I've been very like deep in thought about our most recent conversation with you know everything that I experienced that night when I shared my testimony with that guy. Um, and I think we I mean I think we've talked about other stuff too. I, I don't really even remember. Yeah, whatever you want to talk about. You know, whatever's um, you know most on your mind, I guess. So I can, what, yeah, yeah. While you're collecting your thoughts, let me just uh, share this with you. So, like I was sure. reading um, John 17, I believe it was Friday, and it, to me this this really illustrates uh, that point pretty good. I think uh, when Jesus is talking before he's uh, before they come to get him, um, he's talking about um, you know when he prays to the Father. Uh, he says that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Uh, so, I and them, and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So, as Jesus is, so also will we be. He is our shepherd, and he has led the way. He is the perfect example. We follow him and we will be like him. And we're not like him now, but he has sent the, the, uh, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Ghost. And so those of us that are born of God, we have the Spirit of God in us. And Jesus is the Spirit of God, so Jesus is in us. And we are made whole in spirit, but not not in the flesh. So, uh, you know, you think of uh, circumcision, how you, circumcision cuts off the flesh. Well, um, we are spiritually circumcised now, but on the day of redemption is when this old mortal body will be taken will be cut off and we will be given immortality, immortal bodies. We'll, we will shed this corruptible flesh and put on incorruption. All right, so think about this. If we are uh, sinless, if we, have, if we have everlasting life and all evil is done away with forever, we will be perfect. Right? Right. So everything so you think of Jesus as being perfect. We also will be made perfect. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know what's interesting, um is uh I feel like the idea of perfection and like the idea of being sinless is relative to sort of the um, like having free will, so to speak, in this world, uh, and being like you know like a cursed world of a lot of wickedness. But I feel like the the wicked things that we see happen in this world oftentimes are a result of our ability to make our own choices. And I wonder how that translates.
translates over in a in a different world, you know, in a new new heaven, a new earth, where we are sinless and perfect. Um, are we still able to, you know, it's like how, how does how does how do you reconcile free will with the idea that we uh, will be perfect? Um. Well. Uh... Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I just, I guess I don't see how it could be, uh, you know, I don't know if the right word is exclusive, uh, to where we have free will now, right? Right, but we're not going and killing people, but I mean, we're still sinners, so, so I, I don't know, it's just, it, it's interesting, I don't, I don't think, that, and to clarify, I don't think there's, like, any way to answer this. Because I mean, I don't know. At least I don't. I don't. I don't think it's something we can know right until we get there. We don't. We're not gonna know what it's like fully. We we know what the Bible says about it, and, um, but it's kind of hard to imagine what that would be like. I guess so. I don't know. It's not that it's a rhetorical question. Just it's it's interesting. I think it's something that people will oftentimes bring up. Like the, the idea of free will and like you know because people would ask like why does God allow evil in this world it's like well that's just that's the way this world works because we have the ability to, to shoot I mean and, and think, obviously there's evil things that happen in this world that aren't even or so, aren't even something that mankind did um, natural disasters or whatever accidents but yeah so I just wonder uh, there, there have been plenty of times where I've wondered like how how will our experience be if you know if that if all that wickedness is gone? Why I think it's greater than what we can imagine. I, I do. Um, I don't think we can even imagine being in a world full of people yeah. that never sin, right? That are yeah. pure through and through. I mean, I, 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 we. You know, like to would like to imagine that, and we try to view p others as um, pure and innocent. But bottom line is, this world is just full of dirt, right? <laughs> yeah. So, it, like, so the you know in Genesis three, um, it's because Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's because of that knowledge we have to endure evil until evil is done away with forever. And also in Genesis 3 we have the prophecy of the end of the world when the Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman in between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel and this is a clear reference to the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the clouds of heaven and stomping his foot on the head of the serpent destroying evil forever alright so that's just part of the process that we have to endure because Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So um, I mean, the good news is uh, that evil part is coming to an end. All right. Yeah. And so it's, it's interesting also. Um, it says here, uh, I think, if I remember. Oh, where is that? Where is that? Oh. Where is that verse then? Oh. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. All right. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So, we have to go through this process of, um, you know, having the separation of good and evil, right? Which the Lord has prophesied will happen at the end of the world. 
So again, this is another reference to, um, you know, man um, becoming perfect. And that's really what we hope, that's what we put our hope into, isn't it? Right. Oh, yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, also with the, uh, kind of sparked a, a memory in my head of something else that I wanted to bring up. It's not really on this subject in particular, but with Garden, uh, with Garden of Eden, I'm trying to find something right now. Um, Something that I just very recently discovered. Oh, where was this verse I'm looking for, though? There's a map I wanted to show you here that I've never seen before. It's supposedly from 1595. Uh, and then I saw a couple Bible verses that kind of are what made this interesting. So here's the map. I I can't see it. No, you can't. No, you could you could paste it in uh, the messenger, and I could share it. Oh, that, yeah, that's what I did. I sent it to you. Oh, you did. Okay. I, I okay. I don't know if you could like paint over what your screen share. Yeah. Um, where is this? Oh, give me just one second. I'm trying to find. Oh, my cat is jumping up on my desk. Okay. From what I read, uh, there like a hundred, hundred and fifty years ago, there was a big push to go to the North Pole and to control it, and uh, I think the United States won, and nobody can go there to verify anything. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, so there's, there's really no way to know, right? But, th so there's this, and then there's also um, one other verse. It's kind of interesting. And it's in is in Ezekiel. It is in Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight, <laughs> uh, verses thirteen and fourteen. But what's interesting, I didn't even realize until now. This is isn't it? Were we just talking about this the other day? I think we, we were. We were. says that thou has been in the uh, Eden, thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. And it says, uh, thou was upon the holy mountain of God. So what is the holy mountain of God? The person that, uh, that shared this with me is speculating that, uh, that the holy mountain of God and garden of Eden are in the same place. Yeah, so, no, that's, um, 
So, uh, to me, the very first thing, the, the, the premise has to be right. So, what is the premise of Ezekiel 28? And um, I, I, what am I thinking of here? There's a word here that I'm looking for. Yeah, there it is. Lamentation. Okay. Yeah. So let me just go over this again. So, um, like, for example, in Isaiah 14, um, there is a proverb taken up against the king of Babylon. Thou, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say... Um, and we scroll down a little bit and we see how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. This doesn't mean the king of Babylon is Lucifer. This doesn't mean the king of Babylon was in heaven and he fell from heaven. This is just a proverb, like a saying. It's not an actual recording of events. And so also, in Ezekiel 28, when the Lord says to Ezekiel, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. So this is, again, just a saying, and a lamentation is a, a sorrowful saying. Yeah. And say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealed up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, the you know, and so on. So this is just a saying. It's not an actual recording of events. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, it makes sense. Um, so, I mean, what, what it says... Uh, Holy Mountain of God. I mean, what does that mean? Is that just well, uh, the Holy Mountain? Is that not a physical? No, it's it's not. It in the Old Testament we know that the Holy Mountain of God was Mount. Uh, Sinai. Uh, Sinai. Yeah, thank you. I almost said something else. Uh, Mount Sinai. So that that is just a physical representation of the true Mountain of God, which is. Um, in heaven okay and so that's all gonna come down at the end of the world when there's a new heaven and a new earth so I mean you gotta the reality is this is a the true holy mountain of God is spiritual and not physical well, we know that because this world is coming to an end and like like for example in second peter chapter 3 you know think about this in second peter chapter 3 you know how the whole world was destroyed by water so will this world be destroyed not by water but by fire the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what men or persons ought we to be in holy conversation and godliness? So everything that is on earth is going to be destroyed. What's that verse? There's one more verse that talks about how the mountains will be made plain, and the valleys will be brought up. Oh, you know what I'm talking about? At the end of the world, I think it might be... Oh, I think it's not here. Yeah, no, it is here. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked be made straight, and the rough ways be made smooth. So this is a prophecy from the book of Isaiah. And... Um, this is, um, you know, a foretelling, if you will, of 
the new heavens and the new earth. There, there's a couple of other places that support this as well. But the idea, the idea is that, okay, so let's say that the mountain of God is Mount Sinai over uh, across the ocean somewhere, okay? If that was the mountain of God, and then God comes and sends fire on the earth and just and makes that mountain low. That doesn't really square up, does it? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So well, the holy one mountain. One question I have about could... this. Um, sorry, I don't know if you have anything else to say. No, I'm just gonna say it's a spiritual term. Uh, yeah. Which which is the spiritual aspect is truer than the physical aspect. Right, for sure, because the physical is not going to last forever. Exactly. Um, so, one other thing uh, that I'm curious about. Do we have any idea where the Garden of Eden was? The, where it could have been? Where it could have been? No, no, it's all speculation. There's no way to know. I mean, there's, there's, there's possible. I would like to. I'd, I'd have to assume that it's possible that uh, it doesn't really even exist anymore. If uh, I mean, because there, there's the flood, and you know, people said like the con continents have changed a lot and stuff. And water's raised in certain areas, and the land has shifted. Maybe, you know, maybe it's underwater now. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not, but. I just, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't either. I don't either. And I don't believe that it's hiding out there somewhere and there's magic powers attached to it. Well, oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, even, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not like... Oh, even, even if it was at the North Pole, I, I would never think that, but... Uh, it's interesting. I mean, it is kind of fascinating to think you know, what, what could be at the North Pole, and then, and then, of course, like, Antarctica, people always say, what's at the edge, and, I mean, there's no way for us to know. Um, Isn't that but, crazy? Isn't that crazy? I mean, we go to the moon and go to Mars and all that stuff, but we can't have better evidence, you know, uh, better knowledge of the North Pole and the South Pole? Yeah, just no, nothing. I mean, I, I know absolutely nothing about it. I don't, I don't think I can even find information about it. I, I could take... <laughs> How is that even possible? I could go, you know, I could walk outside, take a picture, and claim that I'm standing on the North Pole. Who's, you know, how's that <laughs> How's that different than what they're doing in the mainstream media? Yeah. That's essentially what they do. I mean, we'll wait here a couple of months, I could take a picture and claim to be on South Pole... When we're all covered in snow. <laughs> yeah. And prove me wrong. Yeah, so what's the, there's another thing about the north... Of, I'm sorry, about the, the Garden of Eden. What was that? Uh, something about fire. It's being protected by fire. Or it's protected. It's protected... You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Oh, there's um, something set up to where oh, something is it right there in Genesis two? No, it's Genesis three. So he drove man. So he drove out man. And he placed at the east of the garden. So he played. Uh, so he drove out man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Um, so, uh, if you can imagine, uh, there's magical powers there. And you found it. Um, and there's no way to get to it. That's the idea that I had in my head. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what it sounds like. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's just amazing reading some of some of these things how uh, almost fantastical this this world can seem. I mean, more more than any more than any fantasy movie or TV show or anything like the world we live in is is so much more fascinating. I mean, not just the world per se, but this this reality. I mean, this this existence that we're in is, is fascinating. There's something else I, that sparked my... When you mentioned the fire... Oh... I don't know if I can find it. But I realized... I, don't, I didn't know if we ever even really talked about it. Um, well, we might have talked about it briefly, but it, it was totally mind-blowing to me. Uh, I know there's a couple of verses I'm missing here, but one of them here is... In Revelation, I want to say it's in Revelation one. Let me double check. Yeah, yeah. Starting at starting at verse uh, well, starting at verse twelve or thirteen. What well, I was reading this. I mean, obviously, I've read this many times before, but for some reason, it was just so mind blowing. Reading it most more recently, because it's describing God, right? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is incredible, and it was consistent with uh, what was it? Well, it's consistent with a lot of things. Uh, here, here it is. Let me, I found, I don't know which verse this is. Let me find it real quick. It is in, uh, oh, come on. My search is being picky here. Uh, Daniel chapter 7. And what's crazy, right, is that these are, Two different, so Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, uh, verse 9 and 10, these are consistent, this is consistent with, uh, with what the, the, uh, revelation that John was getting, and yet they're, what, like hundreds of years apart, probably? Yeah. Uh, hundreds of thousands, no? What, uh, what really? is what is it? oh you no maybe it's on not quite a thousand what was it um no i don't actually i don't know I, for some it's reason a, some, some. yeah for some reason i was thinking it was maybe 800 years but i don't think there's any way to know that either for sure right the, exactly but nonetheless a long I mean, they, they, well, they did not live at the same time, right? No, not at all. It, one thing to keep in mind is that Daniel was living during the, the Babylonian Empire. And since then, right, right. since then, there's been the Medes and the Persian and the Greek Empire and now the Roman Empire. So, yeah, I mean, it was quite a while ago. And so when John wrote his, it was during, at the beginning, sort of, um, relatively speaking, of the Roman Empire before it turned into the Roman Catholic Church. And it was, and it was after Jesus had been resurrected, right? Right. right. Is, is that correct? When, yeah. Yeah. And, so, and I don't believe it was a long period of time. Yeah, it was long, long, but, long period of time between the two prophecies. And they're, and they're perfectly consistent. I mean, and it, it just absolutely blew my mind reading this. Yeah. And the the, the fire part was what because it says his throne was like a fiery flame. Uh, and his wheels is burning fire. That's what it says in Daniel seven, and then, uh, and then of course like his, um, his garment white as snow, and the hairs of his head like pure wool. And he says the exact same thing here. Yeah, his hair in Revelation one, his head and his hairs were like wool, white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Uh, his feet like unto fine brass, as they burned in a, in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And then, of course, uh, he had a, in, in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And we've heard 
plenty of times, uh, but in particular, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Mm-hmm. Uh, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Uh, the, so, uh, that's just amazing. That is so amazing to me. Dividing asunder and, even of spirit and soul. Right? And, yeah, and, it, and it's right there. He sees <laughs> out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. And that is the word of God. And he says, uh, Behold, I am alive evermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. I mean, that's, that, that just shakes you to your core right there. <laughs> uh, yeah, if that's not God, there is no God. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, that's so incredibly powerful. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. It, it, it really is. Uh, you know, the, that's why I lean on Daniel uh, quite, a, quite often. Uh, mm-hmm. One, because it's remarkable how much of it applies to the New Testament and today and you know applies to what we're seeing today and at the same time it's equally incredible how many people are uh, teaching this incorrectly what we what we're reading here uh, all throughout the book of Daniel it's incredible and I think it's almost like there's so much truth in it that this book has to get that much attention in the other way uh, to distract people from learning the truth, it, it's it's incredible, and I you know, I feel like I've talked about this quite a bit, but in, in Daniel chapter nine it, is what I'm referring to right. when it's talking plainly about Jesus being the the Christ, and he's the, I mean he's the one that makes an end of sin, and here we got so many right. so many evil. And wicked teachers claiming this is talking about the Antichrist. For he shall confirm the covenant with many. I mean, even today, it's 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 a very popular teaching. They say that the Antichrist confirms the covenant with many for one week. And I, this is what I heard from Hal Lindsey and others when I first became a you know a Bible believing Christian. Is that I, he would say this and he would talk about it as though it was the Antichrist and so now we're looking for somebody in the Middle East to to make a peace treaty right you've probably heard that a dozen yeah. times if not a hundred and the, yeah. this and this is the verse that they're referring to and this verse is in no way talking about today n- nor is it talking about an Antichrist making a, pe- a peace treaty if you say this is the Antichrist, you are claiming that Jesus is the Antichrist. Because he has already done this. This was fulfilled yeah. upon his death. And it, and, uh, and the, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, which is his return. So he has already made this covenant when he laid down his life for the sins of the whole world and he you know and he took it back up you know you think about in the midst of the week he laid down his life at the end of the week he rose back to life and ascended to heaven so I mean to me it's just incredible it's incredible how you could deceive so many people by just incorrectly uh, implying that uh, this is talking about the Antichrist. It's absolutely incredible. Nowhere in yeah. this is it suggesting that idea at all. <laughs> the Messiah. The anti. You know, not only are you claiming Jesus is the Antichrist, you're claiming the Messiah, or the Antichrist is the Messiah. And, and, <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> okay, excuse me. <clears throat> and let's go even further. They talk about the third temple being built. <laughs> that's that's equally amazing because uh, th- this was the dispute that Jesus had uh, with the Jews or the Jews the dispute that that, that they had um, when Jesus said uh, in uh, he said in three days tear down this temple and in three days I will build it back up 
uh, and then the Jews said, In forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? This is the, this is, um, is what they're talking about. Okay, so Jesus destroyed the temple when he laid down his life. It's not a it's not a Solomon's temple, it's not a Herod's temple, it's not an earthly temple at all. The temple is the body. And Jesus tore down that temple and he built it back up in three days. And the Jews didn't understand it then. And the Jews, or people, non-believers today, don't understand it either, still. It's incredible. I mean, you get what I'm saying? So, the prophecies of Daniel about te about the, the temple being destroyed, it was always about Jesus. And he destroyed the temple. And it's just, to me, it's just absolutely incredible. Know ye not that your body is the temple here? See if we can find. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God yeah. dwells in you, right? And right there, below that, know that ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. Yeah, yeah, it's not. What do we we think that apparently they don't. <laughs> no, you think what? There's nothing, nothing in the Bible that supports this idea of a third temple. The temple being destroyed was always about Jesus laying down his life. It's incredible. Okay. And, it, you know, it's probably, you know, I mean, I'm guessing that this is being talked about a lot in the news. Um, you probably know better than I do. I, the only uh, reason Are I... Are you talking about the, oh, the Antichrist stuff? No, no the, the Israel stuff. I'm sorry. Um... The, the stuff going on in Israel, right there. See, this guy has every yeah. single day is Israel Gaza war camera skyline video coverage. I mean, like you know, yeah, this is. I, I I try I I pretty much like go out of my way to avoid uh, hearing about most of the stuff. If I do hear anything about it, it's usually on social media or from like a friend. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't even. I don't even want to waste my energy with it. Really, it's just. It's the. That's the uh, image of the beast, as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's interesting. I was watching the football game last night, and they had this commercial, uh, you know, about uh, Jewish hate, and of course they <laughs> they equate it to Muslim hate, and uh, well, that the message was that if you post something on. Uh, social media it'll spread across the world real fast and all this and that and uh, you know so we've got to put an end to um, Jewish hate and Muslim hate and black hate and uh, LBGQWT hate or whatever yeah uh, so but but uh, uh, it was interesting I didn't see uh, putting into Christian hate right of course nobody would know what that meant anyway so it doesn't matter uh, and it'll never happen. And that's gonna. No. Do it. I mean, that we're we're gonna be seen as the cause, as the source of all that hate. We are. Well, you don't think flesh and blood inherits the kingdom of God? You're anti-Semitic. Right. No. I mean, the Bible itself is anti-Semitic. I mean, come on, <laughs> man. It's it. Not yeah. only that, the Bible is. Let's see. Can we find some more hate in the Bible? Thou shalt not lie with mankind oh, as yeah. with womankind. There it is. You talk about Homophobic. hate. <laughs> Homophobic. God. Who? <laughs> Let's see. What's the Bible say about who killed the Lord Jesus? Let's see here. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Who killed the Lord Jesus? Oh. Even as they yes. have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus. Okay, that's not so bad. And their own prophets. All right, this guy's not so bad. And have persecuted us. Okay, okay. And they please not God. 
and are contrary to all men. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's uh, what do you call that? Uh, racist or uh, bigotry or anti-Semitic, yeah. right? Anti-Semitic, I don't even know what that means. Anti-Semitic. Is that anti, the... Anti-Jew, I guess, which, I mean, they're not even real Jews. They're the synagogue of Satan. So. What, what, what's the word for anti Christetic or whatever, you know? I mean, it's the only, you got this strange word that only applies to Jews. You don't have any other words, do you? That, I don't know. I don't, I've never understood it. Anti-Semitic. Don't get it. And so... Yeah, I don't... It, and I tell you what, it drives me crazy when people talk about the Jews that reject the Lord Jesus Christ as if they were God's holy people. It's unbelievable. Sometimes, sometimes I feel like these words were just made up just to protect these uh, obviously heretical minorities. Yeah. They call yeah. homophobic and anti-Semitic and whatever else. Yeah, yeah, so anyway, I better, I'll probably get kicked off YouTube now. Yeah, yeah, say goodbye to your, your, your YouTube channel if you recorded this. Um, I mean, I don't know, I don't think we're saying anything too bad, but, uh, one, one other thing, though, on the previous subject that we were talking about that I was going to just bring up, um, and I don't have my, I wasn't cross-referencing verses here because I didn't want to distract myself from what you were saying. But I was trying to find the last time I had a conversation with somebody about that, uh, you know, people thinking that it's talking about the Antichrist. Let's see, what chapter was that? Was that Daniel? Was that Daniel twenty-four? Or am I way off? Yeah. Did you say Daniel twenty-four? I'm way off, aren't I? Yeah. There's twelve yeah, chapters in 24. Daniel. Yeah. What am I looking for here? It's verse twenty-six, is what someone said. What am I? I don't know what I'm thinking of here. What? Uh, Daniel. Oh, it's Daniel nine. Yeah. Let's see. I guess that's what we were just talking about, so it's obvious. Yeah. Uh, and... It's talking about the Messiah. It straightway says Messiah. And after three score and so, two weeks, so the said, Messiah be cut off. Go ahead. They said the, the prince... <laughs> I'm just... We've already talked about this. I mean, this is a few months ago. I was just trying to wrap my head around what in the world is this person thinking? Now, they're wrap, they're, they're pairing this misunderstanding that they have with another misunderstanding uh, about a seven-year tribulation, but we don't even need to get into that. Well, uh, it's not in the Bible, they, so how could we? The, so they so they screenshotted from their phone, so it's, it's, the beginning says, Prince shall be seven weeks. Where does that come up at here? Can we get your screen share up? Um, let me see here. Where's, okay. So in Daniel 9, where, where even is this? There it is. Okay, so it start, it's in the middle. It, at the beginning of the screenshot, it's in the middle of verse 25. Daniel 9, 25. Well, that's convenient that he cut off. He has it shown right at Prince. Because he says, so I did some reading because I asked him. I was like, where in the Bible does it say whatever it is he's claiming? He says... So I did some reading, screenshot of this. The prince that is mentioned isn't the Messiah. <laughs> Here, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna send you the screenshot, so you can see how convenient this is. I mean, I, I don't think that. I, uh, I like this guy. He, he's a good, he's a good kid. He's younger. Um, he just doesn't. He just, he's just wrong about this, obviously. But uh, it's it's kind of hilarious when I look at that screenshot, and then he he says. The prince that is mentioned isn't the Messiah. Verse 26, the people of the prince that shall come, that isn't the Messiah. This prince will set up the covenant. Well, so if I if I take that screenshot, I'm trying to find out where it is. Prince shall be seven weeks. That's at the, that's the top of that screenshot, right? Yeah. So let's look at Daniel 25 and in a word search. Prince shall be seven weeks. There it is in verse 25. And what does it say right before? Messiah. The prince. It's unbelievable. That's deceptive. That's dishonest. Yeah. It, it's just, it's you're not even being honest with yourself. Yeah. 
and you're ho putting and you're putting your hope in that the guy you're talking to doesn't know what he's what he's talking about either, right? So I mean that's what yeah. they do. That's what they do. They they themselves have been fooled, and so they're hoping that the people they they talk to are as dumb as they are, really. And that's so yeah. that's why it's so important to read the Bible every single day, even if it's just a little bit. So you get more and more familiar, more and more grounded in the word of truth. And because there are people out there, they're, it's not like they know the truth and they're trying to trick you. It's a case of they don't know the truth and they've been fooled. And they will fool you if you don't know. And that's, that's how the deception works. That's how it grows and becomes stronger. And that again, that's what Jesus is talking about, the blind leading the blind, right? Yep. Um, yep. It's in the Bible, trust me. It's there somewhere. <laughs> no, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, I think you just said it right yeah. there. They be blind yeah. leaders of Le the blind. Leaders. Yeah. 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 And th really, this is kind of almost like a test that we all are facing and that is, are we going to put our trust in man, or are we going to put our trust in God, because uh, they are contrary one to another. And to me, people are putting, so many people are putting their trust in, you know, either what they're seeing on TV, or what Reverend Smitty says behind the pulpit. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Because they're not, they're not taking the time to read and study the Bible for themselves, they're putting their trust in what he says rather than what God says. Yeah. And you're setting yourself yeah, up. Time. Yeah. Yeah, you're setting yourself up when you do that. So, and it's interesting <clears throat> because, um, you know, I, I've been doing this for a while now, and it's it's very interesting to me how more, the more you read the Bible, the simpler it becomes, the easier it is to understand. And you start to see that everything that we're reading in Genesis is supported all throughout the Bible. And that you can connect the dots all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And then, of course, what we read in Revelation, you can draw a line, connect the dots all the way back to Genesis. And essentially you're getting the same ideas and the same com concepts repeated over and over and over all throughout the Bible and the more you read the more you're able to connect the dots and see the similarities and to see the simplicity of it all it's not yeah. rock it's not rocket science man you don't need to go outside of the Bible to understand what is written inside the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's That's incredible. What everyone tries to do, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, they don't want to believe the Bible, do they? A lot of people. I had that conversation this morning with somebody. They don't want to believe the Bible. Um. See, you see this up here. Uh, you know, I could show you some of the ridiculous comments here. Okay, so that's a new one. This one right here, Junior Rodriguez. Um, this conversation here is 55 replies. It's too long. I want oh, to, wow. Yeah. And it's from Mike MacGyver, or whatever his name is. He essentially, he doesn't believe um, the Bible. He believes the Book of Enoch. He believes in fallen angels. And... Yep. Um, that sort of stuff. And Junior Rodriguez, I'm not so sure of. Let me read this. Great, it's not hard then. As we know, God formed Adam, and Adam named Eve. They had three sons first, and the rest came later. Okay, so Cain marrying his sister kind of gets discredited here, because Cain marries his wife before chapter 5 of Genesis. But I mean, it's really servants serving masters. So, follow Christ. Now, you have a thought on that? Um, I mean, if you don't understand what he's saying, I'll, I'm right there with you. So, 
Okay, so this yeah, conversation have... somehow went from this to. Um... <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. I, I was gonna say. I think I missed some context. Yeah. See how this so, but... so the the question is, um, where where did Cain find his wife? Yeah, I just I just saw somebody talking about this a day or two ago. I wasn't talking to you about that, was I? I don't recall. No, no, I wasn't. It was just it was from a video I was watching. It's just a funny coincidence. I think it was yesterday, but but uh, but I don't know. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, it's implied that it was there was only. Few, it's implied that there was only a few people, so it could only have been Cain marrying his sister, right? But then at the same time, I don't know. I think in the video that I was watching, they they were saying uh, it's kind of like an irrelevant detail that people like to pick on. Yeah, no, I think it's relevant. Um, but it, so um, the, the way I'm reading. In understanding what Junior Rodriguez is saying, he says, uh, "Yabba dabba do and Scooby Doo be do." Therefore, <laughs> the idea of uh, Cain marrying his sister gets discredited. It's like you draw that out of nothing. Great, it's not hard then, as and as we know, God formed Adam, and Adam named Eve. They had three sons first, and the rest came later so there goes that idea that Cain married his sister so yeah so he's a yabba dabba do scooby dooby do the rest came later so, so, there, so does the rest came later mean God just formed a bunch of other random people that's Is that what he's, that's what he wants to say but he can't say it because he knows it's not in the bible <laughs> that's exactly what yeah. they want to say so, I mean, the idea, it's, so you, <laughs> I've had this conversation, this is, to me, this is elementary school stuff, this might even be preschool stuff, um, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> because it's very simple, here, let's go to, yeah, we can do this here, we can go do this here, in Genesis 5, we see that Adam and Eve had sons, and daughters right so <laughs> we go to Genesis 2 we know Adam was the first man right and so we get a description of you know man uh, being made by God and then God breathing into his nostrils the breath of life and so on and so forth and we read about the first Adam is, you know, and then the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Eve is the mother of all living. All right, so you can't get around that. All right, so <laughs> there was not another mother, right? Mm -hmm. So Cain came from Eve. You don't know what am I doing here? Cain. Uh, let's do it this way. And so, and so does so does his wife. His yeah. So if Cain came from Eve and she is the mother of all living you can't get around that Cain's yeah. wife had to also come from Eve there's just yep. no way around it and of course I you know I I try to limit um, the conversation because when I'm when I'm having these conversations with these guys I don't want to put too much on the table you know what I mean uh -huh. but I'm waiting for one of them to say well that's wicked or that's evil that's disgusting that's perverted that's incest and all that sort of stuff because 
um, you know that the laws against incest didn't come until Moses. Right. So, I mean, yeah. what are they supposed to do? You know, God uh, commands them to be fruitful and multiply. Well, God obviously designed it differently at the time when there's only two people on earth. Uh, you know, obviously, it, it's not like he didn't have the foresight to think that, you know, I just think that after a time, enough people have multiplied that, uh, that he then uh, forbade or whatever mm-hmm. incest much later on. Right, and, and you also got to consider the world was much different in the days of Moses than it was in right. the days of Adam and right, Eve exactly. and Noah. Exactly. People were living much, much longer in the days right. of Adam and Eve. Yeah, but it, it's interesting yeah. to me to have those conversations because, um, you know, just it, you know, gives me an opportunity opportunity to study a little bit in the, the Book of Genesis and the beginning, which I find fascinating and interesting. It you know, really is. It really is. Every time I. Every time I go back, I'll, I'll read the you know parts of Genesis, and then I'll I'll kind of be I'll have my mind on something else for a while. Revelation and you know John and whatever it's random random chapters, and then every so often I'll go back to Genesis, and it's just so fascinating. And just talking about the Garden of Eden, that's that's, that's kind of where I've come come back to it again more recently. Is about the Garden of Eden, and it's really interesting stuff. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, the other day somebody mentioned something about um, we want to get back to the Garden of Eden. And I'm like, why? Why? Why would you want to go back to the Garden of Eden? Uh, Just because what happened at the Garden of Eden, you want to go back there and then repeat the whole process of the pain (laughs) and suffering that we're going through? I mean... You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I don't believe in evolution, but in a sense, I, in this sort of sense, you know, I do, <laughs> because we want to get beyond that point where there is evil. Okay, so now, yeah. now we've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now we want to get to that place where evil is all destroyed. Or I'm sorry, all where all evil is destroyed, and then get beyond that to a world where there is no sin, no death, no sorrow, no crying, none of that stuff. Right. When when you say evolution, um, in in the real sense, like what happens in reality, it could be compared to learning, growing, progressing. Uh, Monkey evolution is like a sci-fi thing that man made up right that's, that's not what actually happens yeah. uh, but, but we, we do adapt we, we do adapt and, and overcome and learn and change and grow obviously those things really happen yeah they yeah, I mean in that sort of sense right um, right what was that verse I had earlier um, was it study to show thyself approved a good workman needed not to be shamed rightly dividing the word of truth no, 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 that's not it. It's all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So in that sort of sense of the word evolution, that's really what we're in, uh, aspiring to to do, is, yep. to, is, is to grow, not to... Not to grow antennas on our head, but to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what, isn't that what Darwin's evolution is about? Growing antennas and extra fingers and killing black people? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't... It's just that we came from, I came from a fish and... Uh, life has no meaning and we just kind of happen here by chance and it's funny when you see the, the the order and design in the world i mean it's just overwhelming 
uh, an abundance of evidence that uh, we come from a creator, um, and yet uh, people believe people have this like alternative uh, to to where that could have how that could have happened. But there's absolutely no way uh, that all of this order could have come from something other than an intelligent mind, you know, something other than God. Somebody made a really good uh, example. I thought it was a good example anyway. Uh, but I, I'll kind of butcher their exact quote, but they were basically saying, if, if I'm out in the middle of the woods uh, and I'm walking around by myself, I want to say you said, like, if I'm walking with my dog or something, or we're out, out in the woods walking, there's nobody there, and all of a sudden I see a, a ball come rolling in front of us basketball or soccer ball or something whatever he's not gonna think oh well that's just that just got there by chance like that he's not gonna think that that got there you know incidentally like came out of the woods or something like obviously somebody put that there uh you know you wouldn't i mean it just sounds so obvious but you wouldn't think that that just happened to get there like obviously someone had to have put that there same with like your shirt that you're wearing it's not like it's not like they just threw together a mess of stuff and it just happened to turn into a t-shirt and somebody had to weave that t-shirt for it to, for it to work. And it's the same with, same with this world. Like there's an, in, in our, in our bodies, I mean, our bodies are fascinating. There's no way that our bodies could have just happened. They're, they're too, they're too brilliant. They had to have been, they had to have come from a designer. Oh, no question. No question about it. It's, I feel stupid just for, for once, you know, I once, I thought that. Me yeah. too. Oh yeah, and I, and I was sitting here telling people uh, that, you know, they don't, that they're wasting their time believing in God and stuff, and I feel like for a while that kind of bothered me when I would see people trying to do that to me. It maybe frustrate me a little bit, irritate me, but it really doesn't anymore. I, I've become so incredibly, and I, obviously I still have a lot of room to grow and a lot of, uh, there's a lot that I don't know. Um, I'm still very, I, I can see what it looks like to truly be very, very studied on the Bible, and I know that I'm not there yet. But I will say, even in the last few months, my, my faith has grown tremendously. I don't know what happened. Um, just, I feel like my understanding, I mean, it's been, it's been slowly getting better. I feel like there was maybe a bit of a lull um, for a few years. Or maybe I didn't learn that much, or maybe my understanding wasn't really growing. Um, I don't know. And I mean, that's my fault, I suppose. But something about uh, the last couple of years for me, and especially this year, and especially the last few months, something has really, really solidified my faith and my understanding of... Uh, and I think it's because I meditated more on the very, very basic fundamentals of who Jesus is and how the sacrifice that he made applies to me, specifically me, you know, and, and just to really ponder that and to really get a good idea, a good understanding in your mind and in, but in your heart more than anything. I think that's kind of one of the main things that triggered my, my growth and faith more recently is I had to, I had to consider that I, maybe mostly knew God in my mind and I needed to make sure I knew him in my heart more. I, I don't know. I don't know if what I'm saving him makes sense, but it completely, I feel like it completely transformed the way that I, the way that I feel and the way that I understand, you know, Jesus and that sacrifice now. I, I feel so incredibly confident. I've never been more confident in anything in my life. Like I, and I'm not to say that I wasn't saved before. I mean, I think I was, but just, I don't know. It just, you know, it's, it's incredible to see your faith grow. It's really, it's truly like a, a seed being planted and growing and turning into fruit. It's like now I feel like I, I've got new fruit uh, in me where I just have a, a better understanding and more confident. And uh, it's just amazing, really. Yeah, yeah, so... And it's all about faith. I think what you're describing is right. your faith has grown. And it's interesting because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. 
right? So, if you think about this, um, the the root of your faith is the Word of God, and so that's really the key to growing in faith is believing the Word of God. And it, to me, uh, it's incredible to see all these people pretending like they believe the Bible and they really don't believe the Bible at all. And one indicator for that is anytime somebody points to the Greek or the Hebrew. Think about this. If you believed, like Isaiah 29, verse 16, where it says, Shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. All right, so let's say you, if if you believe that, if you believe that is the word of God, and that's the perfect word of God, you wouldn't have any desire to go to another language at all. You got it right there. Now, if you right. if you don't believe what you're reading, then you want to go to another language because you don't believe what this says, right? And so, and that's a lack of faith. And and where did that sort of mindset begin? Do you know? I think it started right there in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Now the serpent yeah. was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, as God said, Surely you're turning, uh, or surely the thing framed to him that said it. Or that framed it had no understanding. I mean, you get what I'm saying, right? It. Yeah, absolutely. The serpent is getting Eve to doubt the word of God. So you can't believe what this says. You have to go to the Greek. This is an age-old thing that's been going on for a long, long time. And then, of course, I mean, we get, I mean, we're, we get stuff related to this all throughout the Bible. We really do. And that's what I was talking about earlier. The more you read. The more you see how everything is, uh, you know, connected. There, it's it's really telling us a lot of the same thing over and over and over again. In Second Corinthians 11, but I fear lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And that's, again, that's what I mean. That The Bible is actually very simple. Um, it All you have to do, number one, you have to believe in it, like what you're talking about. Your faith has grown. That's that's really where um, you grow, is when you have faith, when you believe. Without that belief, you're not going to have any understanding, any growth whatsoever. And one, one of the things that I point to, I'd like to point to, to... Um, to support that is here in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 15. Even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Why? Because they do not believe. Because they don't believe there's a veil upon them. They read it, but they just don't understand it. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. When they shall turn to the Lord, that's all about faith. It's all about faith, and it's always been about faith. So, I mean, it's pretty incredible. Um, and, you know, the, again, uh, I forget what the converse. Oh, yeah, the conversation about uh, in whom God, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that okay. believe not, right? And that, and who does? And wait a second, where am I in here? Um. Something's wrong. Something's wrong here. What am I? What am I missing? Did I put the wrong word in? I want to go to Isaiah. Isaiah six. Yeah, make the heart of this people fat. Yep. And make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. And that's a parallel to what we read in, um, in you know, in the New Testament, in 
when Jesus says, uh, for this, I mean, he echoes the same thing that we read in Isaiah. Mm-hmm. For this people's heart is waxed gross, their yeah. ears are dull of hearing in their eyes. They have clothes, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. It's, it's amazing. And Romans 11 as well. Romans 11? Yeah, so it just repeats that sort of, oh, that's sort of right, stuff. That's right. Uh, that's right, yeah. Um, what's the... It's worded... Um, it's not exactly... Uh, spirit of slumber. So, verse 8. Oh, right there. Right there it is, yep. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that, that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And again, uh, this is another one of those um, verses that makes it clear that it is God that is blinding them, their minds. In, in whom the God of this world, that there's only one God. I think that gets overlooked by a lot of people. There's not dueling gods. It's, just, it's not like there's Jesus and there's his brother, Satan. We're not Mormons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible how many people want to believe Satan is a god. Satan is not a god at all. Satan is the absence of God. And, and, and so, uh, there was, I think, two people, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, in the last couple of weeks, who are, it might even be part of that conversation I shared with you earlier. And I don't care to even go through it again, but... 55 comments, that's crazy. Yeah, he's basically... Yeah, I don't know. Well, so, yeah, so, um, he might be one of them, and there was another fella, too, that said, oh, I, I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. I was like, well, what, man? If you, the 1611 has a capital. And I, after showing him, you know, Exodus 20, verse 3, for example, I mean, I, to me, this is amazing. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, Oh, yeah, but Satan's God. Well, wait a second. There's only one God. Yeah. You, it's, contra- it's contradictory to say Satan is God. And it's against the Ten Commandments, the very first of the Ten Commandments. And then, of course, oh, what verse was that? Second Corinthians 4.4, 4, right? And people want to make a big deal out of the capitalization. And I, I, oops, I admit it's interesting. Why is it not capitalized? It should be capitalized, right? But it's not that big of a deal because it doesn't change the fact that God is God and that Satan is not a God at all and whom the God, right there, is capitalized. If you needed to see it, you know, the, the visual, right? It's right yeah. It's right there. And whom the God, capital G, uh, you know, that's the way it should be. And, I, I, you know, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think maybe maybe when they did the uh, the new what is it Cambridge or whatever maybe they just saw the God uh, just didn't didn't capitalize it because they're just using God as a word rather than like the title of God like the Heavenly Father yeah. right maybe yeah. they were just saying doesn't change what it means right. it still means the same thing but just right. because of the wording in whom the God of right. this world who is there's only one so. Yeah, yeah, I think it makes sense. It makes perfect sense, really. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I think you've got it exactly right. Whether it's capitalized or not, it still has the same meaning. Even the verse before, but if our gospel, that, that that's not like a different gospel. It's the same gospel, whether right. it's capitalized or not. <laughs> and, and one other thing too uh, that's worth pointing out here uh, that is really important, I think, Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. Uh, because if, if, you know, if, if, if what we're saying is wrong and that Satan is the one blind people, well then, how do you explain Matthew twenty-eight eighteen? And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Well, what are you just saying? Well, what about Satan? He's got power, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. apparently he doesn't. 
Yeah, I mean, it's astonishing, really. It's astonishing. You don't want to, why, I don't know why people do, but you, you don't want to view Satan as a god hiding under your bed or whatever. I mean, that's, it's not true. And it's gonna, only going to prevent you from understanding the Word of God and the Spirit of God. It's preventing you. It's not helping you to imagine Satan as a god. Satan is not a god. All right. Yeah. So, did you want to uh, talk a little bit about you know uh, that experience you had before you were a believer? Well, I can't. I, I didn't know. I didn't know if I should get into that or not. Um, it's up to you. You know, if you if you wanted to, I mean, for the sake of maybe having a video, I mean, we've been talking for a while now. We, um, we can save it for next week or, or yeah, later on this yeah, week. Yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. I, yeah, why don't we do that? I, okay. I, uh, I have been reflecting on it a lot since I shared it with that other fella. Um, we'll, we'll save it for next week. Yeah, and maybe uh, we can somehow I'll, learn... Uh, they use it as a teaching moment uh, for somebody that's listening to because it's quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah. I can't even begin to describe. I mean, I, I've talked to you about it many times. But I can't even begin to describe uh, what that was like. You know, one thing, though, that I want to say that I, I don't know if I ever shared this part with you. It's kind of silly, but... Um, I don't want to get into too much detail about it if we're going to have a separate session for it. But I remember uh, the next day, or it's like the next morning, I just had this overwhelming feeling of a, sort of a connection to God. I didn't quite understand yet, but I remember thinking that if, if my dad knew, he would be so proud <laughs> to know that I that this happened. Because uh, at the time, you know, I wasn't a believer and stuff, and you were always talking to me about God and, and everything, and I was just young and dumb. I didn't know what I was doing, but I don't know. The more the more I reflect on it, the more and and I and one thing though I do I will say is, you know, I was talking about how my faith has grown so much. I think it's I'm so much more confident, more comfortable that I'm I'm more comfortable kind of reflecting on that experience more. Uh, before I always kind of just wanted to throw it away. I didn't want to let myself have like itching ears or whatever. And, and think, oh, well, maybe I had some sort of divine experience, and, and I was like, well, what if it was bad? I mean, there's no way to know. But now I feel so secure uh, that that I, I am a little bit more comfortable sort of re-exploring what I experienced. So we'll go over that. Um, we'll go over that next week, though. All right, good. That's, sounds good. It's very interesting. Um, so, For sure. Okay, so let's end it right here. All right, sounds good.